Ron Tall. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been such a delight to be at this amazing conference and to be back in Pittsburgh with so many friends. Um, and I, I don't know how I was foolish enough to agree to take this on. And I actually had a comment for every single talk, but then I realized that would take 33 minutes. So instead, um, is this? Oops, I'm sorry. So um, first of all, I'm, and I'm going to come back to this at the end. I, obviously, as everyone said, thanks to Bea and Brad and many, many others for putting together this really amazing conference. And this idea of reflecting a bit uh, on the past, the present, and the future, this field, how it started, what's been happening, where we are, having a conference like this. Um, and I was thinking about these multiple perspectives. And, and I was struck, again, being back in Pittsburgh, by a, a book that I read. Uh, a very a key point in my career, actually, uh, when Fuster, his second edition of his book on the prefrontal cortex, one of the things he was really emphasizing is the role of these systems in cross-temporal contingencies. It's really the ability to use past information projected into the future to decide what to do in the present. And it's a really interesting perspective on how some of this processing occurs. And I, and I was thinking about Sarah Jane's uh, you know, example of the 13-year-old with peers uh, thinking about whether to go ahead and have the cigarette. I mean, you know, the, you, there's a set of processes that have to be invoking the future and the past. But what I want to emphasize first with this example is that it's not just cognitive processes at the level of thoughts. It's the feelings that are attached to those thoughts. It's the anticipated feeling of getting caught by the parent. Or it's one thing to say you're going to get lung cancer when you're 65, but what does that feel like when you're 13? It has no meaning to you when you're 13. And this, these affective weightings in this cross, these cross-temporal processes are really key. But the other reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this is that I, I, it also made me realize there's another really remarkable thing about Bea's, uh, when thinking about these cross-temporal processes, in her naming of this conference. And that is <clears throat> that... <laughs> We know that the key to cross temporal processing is the flux capacitor. Uh, and so, you know, this is really incredibly appropriate that, that this has been the focus. Uh, and, and in addition, the other thing about this is that this, this um, incredible understanding of adolescence and what, and what adolescence is like in this movie, uh, and going into the future and coming back and, you know, meeting his mother and going into the past and meeting his mother, um, it is also interesting because if you look at the time frame uh, when this movie made in 1985, the future was 2012. And so, and so the future is now. Uh, and so I think. What we want to do in, in, this, in this amazing you know, first conference, and I, and I also want to emphasize Bea's choice of the word, whoever it was, an integrative. And I really like that, because I think there are aspects of development of cognitive neuroscience that have, been incredibly, have made incredible progress because they've focused in a really narrow way about specific cognitive processes. But I think the, the field is at a point now, we really want to think about integrating across levels. Keep the focus. But also, this idea that affective, social, developmental influences interact in complex ways, there are components of this. It's really exciting to think about the formation of a society that helps to, to scaffold this and bring it together. Links with the journal DCN have been discussed. I think that could be really exciting. There's preliminary discussions for a meeting next year. Elizabeth Sal is going to take the lead. Adriana Galvan and I are going to help uh, with the organization of that. But I also want to take a step back. And, and think about just a few things from the conference. And I want to begin with David's uh, initial talk, which I thought was amazing at many, many levels. And I, I, I've known David uh, for a long time and I've known bits of this work. But I want us to remember how the complexity he's describing in these developmental trajectories just within one layer, uh, just within one area of prefrontal cortex, and with these incredibly controlled studies in, in primates, and this idea that some of our models are a bit simplistic when we think about the trajectory of development for the region of a brain or for an individual human being. And this idea of these different trajectories for different subcomponents of the same circuit, the implications for how, and, and I, I love the sentence that he used, protracted complex circuitry development with multiple sensitive periods, depending which aspect of the circuit you're interested in. I, I think we need to really keep in mind at one end of the spectrum this level of complexity these complex circuit systems and mechanisms. And I think one of the things that this argues for is the importance of team science. It's not to say it's so complex we can't, we can't tackle it, but I think it's going to require teams of people working together in innovative ways to be able to work across levels. When you think of the impact of a social interaction, a peer interaction, the perception of a peer 
onto these cognitive and affective systems, and then the complexity down to the molecular level, if we're going to begin to make progress in understanding real-world development uh, and thinking about the right questions for animal modeling, we really need teams of people working together. And I think that's one of the exciting things about the developmental part of this field. I think we have been more collaborative and less competitive than some other uh, areas of, of, uh, of neuroscience. And in part because it's so hard to do these studies. It's so hard to recruit kids. It's so hard to get funding for longitudinal studies. And I think we need to do this even better, this coming together. And, and, and then also, the other part of this is not just mapping the brain. I think it's, it's mapping the questions that are going to move the field forward and have impact uh, in relevant to clinical questions, educational questions, and public health questions. And it also stirs up what are the questions. One of the things that came up and, and is this idea of biomarkers for specific psychiatric diseases. I, mean, I spent 20 years in a psychiatry department here, and, and, I, and I think there's a lot of excitement about that approach. But I think, again, we can't be very simplistic about that as if it's a marker for a specific disease or if we understand the disease well enough. I think there are also compelling questions at the level of understanding developmental processes that inform strategy, timing, and targets for early intervention and prevention. And as in Beta's talk, this idea that even within a specific disease, there's this window of time. You've already, you can already tag people who are at high risk for developing it. You can see that these processes are occurring. But if you want to inform what to do to intervene, that leads to a different level of, 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 of question. And the same thing is true, I think, for anxiety, for depression, for risk taking. And I think these are exciting questions that really can inform education and youth policy to prevent and have early interventions for, for for these, uh, these uh, negative trajectories and increase the positive trajectories. And I think, again, these are team science issues. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, both because of what uh, Monique pro probed me to talk about a little bit in terms of the motivational learning idea, uh, I just want to say a few things about this idea, and also because it, it resonated with something that Bita said in her talk that I've been really puzzling about. And this is, this is an idea that there's a component of this uh, cross-temporal <clears throat> contingency processing that really involves feelings as neural signals. There's a lot of work showing that part of what happens with these things we call feelings, there are neural signals that create action tendencies. They carry information. If you have an action tendency, uh, that there's incredible computational processes that you're at a certain level of uh, sodium water imbalance, you have a feeling of thirst that creates an action tendency that is really a signal that has meaning. But there are lots of other signals that have that kind of quality that influence motivation, that influence urges, that influence uh, action tendencies in many domains. And I think we haven't given enough thought to how these neural signals of feelings contribute to what we call motivation. And this is a huge topic. Uh, I, could go on, I could do a long thing. I'm only going to give you a few slides on this idea that this feeling component to motivation in the developing brain is something that really would be interesting to think about using our tools and, and models uh, in terms of developmental cognitive neuroscience to think about. And again, motivation is an incredibly complicated thing, 100 years of work. I, I'm not going to, I'm really talking about a few slices of motivation. And I'm going to just focus for a few minutes on this idea of perseverance. What my, my writing friend Lee uh, calls the essence of, I mean, there's lots of great writers, but it's the fall down nine times, get up 10, that he said makes a difference uh, you know, you, after all these rejections of every article and book. And, and Angela Duckworth has gotten a lot of uh, uh, fame thinking of this idea of grit, this perseverance and passion for long-term goals is really more predictive in some ways than other measurable qualities. And one could ask, are these, in essence, top-down processes? Is, is perseverance mostly an effort, effortful control? Is it mostly cognitive control, overcoming uh, you know, distractions in university? Maybe. Uh, uh, there's, I'm going to give you a contrasting image <clears throat> from Sonic Zoom Ray. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood, don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. The feeling of desire to create hunger for what the goal is, is a different strategy. Now, I say that because let's move beyond falling down nine times and get up ten. Karen Adolph has done real <coughs> field studies and shows that the average toddler falls down 17 times per hour. 14,000 steps, 47 football fields a day, and 100 falls. Now, what motivates a child to keep getting back up, getting back up, getting back up, but they become an expert walker? You know, Jay talked about you know 10,000 hours for a musician changing their brain. I mean, th we're talking about practice, 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 practice. But what motivates this kid to do it? It's not an executive function or cognitive control. 
Um, I mean, I think it would be hard to say that's what's, uh, what's motivating this. You can do the same thing in many other areas. I mean, you know, Mark Johnson has shown that by two months, infants have executed more than 2.5 million eye movements. What do they look at? Well, they look at faces. They have preference for certain kinds of faces. This idea of attractors, what pulls attention, what pulls kids to want to explore their environment, if we don't understand what these attractors do to shaping practice and experience, then I think it's going to be hard to understand some of these processes. And again, it's not simply, what are people motivated to feel? It's not simply that people want to activate reward. They don't want to just get good feelings and avoid bad feelings. In fact, there's a tremendous diversity in what people want to feel. And that's a whole interesting conceptual approach. And what we're going to, if you think about what you want to feel when you're bored versus what you want to feel when you're exhausted, what you want to feel when you're terribly thirsty, lonely. But even if you make a thought experiment where everyone's in a neutral rested state, free from all other biological drives and needs, what do they want to feel? If you had a thought experiment where you put someone in a machine and let them feel anything they wanted, not by naming it with terms, but by fiddling with the dials, you can imagine there's people who would want to feel calm, easy, pleasant feelings. And you can imagine an adolescent boy who would just take every knob and turn up as high as it goes. And these differences aren't just with you know, calm, peaceful versus high intensity feelings or thrills. There's great work on differences in anger. There are people who will do anything to avoid activating their own anger. They hate to feel anger. And then there's people like Rush Limbaugh and the people that listen to Rush Limbaugh. They want to feel righteous anger. That's their favorite feeling. They savor it as if it's the best thing they can feel. And these are real differences in behavior because what people want to feel is different. This is true not only for high intensity emotions, but even, I mean, there's a wide range of things. I mean, of course, most people would prefer to feel happy and joy than sadness, but there's some really strange individual differences, even for very negative feelings. Uh, so, uh, but beyond that, these are interesting issues, not just with personality and temperament and genetics, but these are likely to be differences shaped by experience. And a lot of what we talk about in puberty and sensation seeking and thrill seeking may be related to shifts in what kinds of feelings you're more likely to want to experience. Um, and I also want to talk about if we're going to make progress with things that are as abstract and difficult as feelings and motivations and think about cognitive affective neuroscience, we're going to need models. And I also wanted to mention that Evelyn Crone, who really wishes she could be here, um, and, and I'm just going to just briefly just mention the, 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 the model that we've been talking about and we published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience last year, and this idea of adolescence as a period of social affective engagement and goal flexibility. Uh, and, and this, again, uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through the whole model, uh, but it relates to some of the things <coughs> we are talking about with puberty and adolescence. This idea that it's not, as Linda said, it's not that these subcortical systems are necessarily more mature, but once you hit puberty and start hitting these systems with hormones, there's a set of influences on certainly uh, uh, clearly a subset of these systems, that's going to interact with what kind of motivations depending on what kind of social context and, and all the things that Sarah Jane talked about in terms of the, the draw to want to understand your friends, to be liked by your friends, to have more admiration from peers. These are going to be interacting with these systems. But the point is that that sets in place patterns of behavior of motivational and emotional learning that can affect um, you know, what kinds of experiences people really uh, begins to sculpt these systems during these periods of time. And if these patterns of experience of what kinds of things uh, young people are experimenting with shape not just their habits, and this is, goes back to this we were uh, chatting about with Beta. If this is a key time where, for example, this dor dorsal striatal system, in, which is not just habits and, 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 and action selection, but if it's patterning of behaviors influencing affective patterns, this could really set the trajectory for different motivational tendencies. And I think these have really profound uh, implications. And lastly, uh, again, there's a level at which people have long <coughs> before we had neuroscience recognized some aspects of this. This idea of understanding the affective dimensions of motives and motivations, uh, as Aristotle noted, thought by itself moves nothing. Without feelings of desire, the human capacity for rational thought would lack any power to act. And this, this, the Latin modi is actually uh, the root of both emotion and motivation. And the, the idea that we need to think about feelings as neural signals that, have a, that can have a huge influence on behavior and that can also be shaped by learning that influence motivation, I think is a very provocative and potentially very important slice of understanding these processes. And, and one that I would love to see more people take, uh, you know, take some interest in and maybe we'll have a, a focus on that with a meeting. 
And then lastly, in terms of feelings and the importance of them, uh, there's uh, great feelings of gratitude, uh, thanking the people, <coughs> Bay in particular, and many other people that pulled this together. Uh, they had tremendous amounts of motivation of all types, including being inspired to try to do a meeting like this and, and, and get the field to another level. And then there was lots of effortful falling down nine times, getting up 10, and pushing the boulder up the hill, uh, and resulted in something that's incredibly rewarding, and it's going to make us do something as ridiculous as try to do this again uh, and pull it off, despite everyone's crazy schedules and, 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 uh, and the complexities of doing this. And I, I just really want to give a huge thanks and how much I think all of us have gained from this and really appreciate it. It's been a great meeting.